Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We'll allow a, some time for all the attendees to log in and then we'll begin the webinar shortly. Thank you for joining us. We'll begin the webinar shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our special education webinar series. Today, we're going to be covering school evaluations. My name is Lisa Turner, and I'm the executive director for the ARC of Oklahoma, formerly known for many, many years as TARC. I joined the organization last year after a 20 year history working in the nonprofit world as well as the mother of two daughters, one of which is diagnosed with autism and other developmental disabilities and is 19 years old. My personal experience raising both my daughters, especially mine with special needs, fuels my drive and my passion for ensuring that individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families receive the services and support that they need to live their best life. So thank you again for joining us. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Today, this webinar will be recorded. You may use the Q&A feature to ask questions throughout the webinar. Those questions will be addressed during the Q&A session. We anticipate many questions, so if your question is not addressed due to time constraints, please email that question to Sherilyn Walton in our Family Support Program at the email address shown on your screen. As I mentioned, this is a webinar series. This is the first of four that we'll be hosting the month of October, and those will be each Tuesday at noon covering a different topic. We'll share that webinar schedule with you later on in the webinar, and please also follow our Facebook page for additional information. You may have noticed that we're now the ARC of Oklahoma, so we are transitioning to the state chapter of the ARC of the United States, which is the largest national community-based organization advocating for and with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So we'll officially drop the TARC name as our co-brand on November 1st and formally become the ARC of Oklahoma. We're very excited about this transition and have a lot of plans for continuing the great work that we do and expanding upon those services. So please make sure to sign it for our newsletters, stay in touch with us on Facebook, 
and uh, we'll look forward to partnering with you more in the future. So again, our name and our look is changing, but we're still offering the same services um, for Oklahomans with intellectual and developmental disabilities and excited to be moving beyond just the Tulsa area but serving the entire state of Oklahoma. And just a reminder that we'll continue to serve people across diagnosis and through their lifespan from birth all the way through as they're aging um, and focusing on end of life care. One of our programs that obviously will stay the same is our family support services, which assists parents as they navigate the confusing world of special education and community services. This program provides resource navigation and one-on-one -on -one education support and advocacy, as well as representation at IEP meetings. Our program is led by Sherilyn Walton, a licensed clinical social worker and former special education and general education teacher. I know many of you who are on the webinar today have worked with Sherilyn. We also have Hannah Chaboy, and she is our bilingual resource navigator. She offers IEP support in Spanish, and she also does a number of services in the Hispanic community, including Hispanic support groups. You can email Hannah for more information. So today I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Kelly Davis. Dr. Davis is a special education director for Glenpool Public Schools. She has 24 years of experience as a school psychologist before becoming an administrator. She's been a special education administrator in both Oklahoma and Texas and is currently special education director for Glenpool Public Schools. She's also an adjunct professor for Oklahoma State University and she received her doctorate degree in applied behavioral studies from OSU. She's passionate about supporting teachers and families for the betterment of all children. This time I'll give control over to Dr. Davis for her presentation. Dr. Davis, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I so appreciate being invited to uh, participate in this. Um, I've worked with ARC for uh, a number of years and they are great people doing great things and I just um, appreciate them so much for all they do. Um, so I've been asked to participate today and have a conversation about special education evaluations. I did those for many, many years before becoming an administrator and, um, and they're an important piece of the bigger picture of special education. And so hopefully I'll be able to answer some of the questions uh, that you might have about evaluations and what they do and kind of what they don't do. Um, so I appreciate that. So we are going to start today um, talking about some of the laws that pertain to uh, the way we do evaluations. And the first one we're going to talk about is child find. And I'll try not to inundate you with acronyms because in special education we tend to use a lot of acronyms, but one that I do want you to know is LEA because I will say that a lot, a lot today. Uh, LEA just stands for Local Educational Agency, which is your school district. And so I will say um, basically the LEA is responsible for this, or the LEA does this. So LEA just means your school district. And so um, one of the first things we need to understand about the laws and what the LEAs are responsible for is a, a component of the IDEA called Child Find. And child find just is um, a good law that says, you know, we can't wait for these children to kind of show up at our door. We have to actively go out and look for them um, because we understand that early intervention is critical. Uh, we understand uh, children who get early intervention have better long-term outcomes. And so we really do want to do our job at um, seeking out and finding these children. So child find is an, uh, a part of the law that the LEAs are responsible for. And so the components of child find are locating, identifying, and evaluating. And this presentation is going to focus just on the evaluating piece of that law. So the law says, when do we evaluate? We, re we evaluate when we have reason to suspect. And that's what the, the, word, the wording of the, the legal wording says. When do we have reason to suspect? And when we say reason to suspect, we have to suspect all three things that I'm about to go over. 
we have to suspect that a child would meet the criteria for having a disability. We have to uh, suspect that uh, this disability would ha is having an adverse effect on their educational performance. And we have to suspect that special education services would be needed in order for that child to have a free and appropriate public education. And we'll talk more about kind of when that trigger gets met. Um, but reason to suspect that those three things are what we're looking for uh, when we get, talk about uh, evaluating children. So referrals can come from a, a variety of sources. Like say we work with uh, uh, parents and agencies and, and the community and trying to uh, child find these students. One of the first places we get referrals is from Sooner Start. Sooner Start is the state agency that provides uh, early intervention services for our birth through the age of three. And then at the age of three, um, those children trans, uh, can transfer into the public school district and the public school district, the LEA, uh, can pick up services after that. Uh, we also have a number of uh, resources for early childhood screenings. Uh, your pediatrician may do a, a screening, uh, Sprouts Child Developmental, uh, agencies out there, they do uh, developmental screenings. Uh, the OU Child Study Center does um, developmental screenings. And what a developmental screening will do is through um, the process of asking you about your child's development, we'll compare uh, your child with a, a child of the same age to see if they're being, ex uh, they're developing their milestones at the expected rate. And when there's not that development, then we would have a concern. So that would be another source where we would get a referral. Medical professionals uh, sometimes will refer to us uh, when they suspect that there's um, a need. Um, school intervention teams, when they uh, suspect a reason, they have reason to suspect. Um, they do this through um, their intervention process, which is called different things in different school districts, um, but school uh, intervention teams would refer when they have reason to suspect. And then of course, parents may always uh, request an evaluation at any time. Uh, and this includes children up until um, 45 days before their third birthday. So even two-year-olds, we, we evaluate two-year-olds uh, if it's in 45 days within their birthday. Um, a parental request for an evaluation doesn't automatically trigger the requirement to evaluate, but we will talk more about that later. Um, and the other piece of this law says that we can't use uh, intervention strategies to deny or delay uh, an ind individual evaluate, evaluation. Okay, so the request for uh, an evaluation by a parent um, says that we, we need to um, consider all requests from parents. And even though they're not legally re required, we have to provide them um, informed consent if we do want to proceed with the evaluation and if we decide that the child doesn't need the evaluation we would provide you the reasoning why we decided the child didn't need evaluation the reason we didn't have a reason to suspect uh, a reason to suspect so in that case the school would provide you with um, documentation about that and something called a reds which we'll talk about later which is a form um, and a written notice and they would also give you a copy of your parents rights Okay, so um, the RED is the first piece of information that we look at, and what a RED is, it's called the Review of Existing Data, and it has everything we know about the child, both from the parent providing the information, school records, any medical information we might have. We put all of this onto a document called the RED, and if we review that information and say there's enough information in this evaluation that we should have reason to suspect, we would go ahead and proceed with getting consent to do that evaluation. Um, and, if, and if we don't have that information for reason to suspect, then we would document it there, also uh, explain why we didn't have reason to suspect. If we proceed with the evaluation, uh, we, we, uh, the next step forward is getting um, parent consent. And we have to get what they call informed consent um, and we, uh, there's no um, definite timeline for this, but typically the law says a reasonable amount of time and reasonable as interpreted by um, uh, case law is seven to eight weeks. Um, so within seven to eight weeks of being um, 
having the reason to suspect is when we should get the informed written consent from the parent. Informed consent includes all of this. Uh, we need to make sure that you know what's going to happen after you sign consent. We need to make sure that it's in your native language and that you understand. Uh, we need to tell you what areas or what uh, disabilities we are suspecting at that point. When we have reason to suspect, we would say we have reason to suspect a specific type of disability and we'll go over those later. Um, we'll uh, inform you of what areas we're going to be evaluating. And then we also tell you that you can revoke this consent at any time. So if you sign consent and give consent, but then later on change your mind, that's perfectly okay. The evaluation uh, is conducted by a group of people. You know, I say I do evaluations, but I do them with a team of people. So everybody that you see listed on this slide is participates in some form or fashion with the evaluation, whether it's providing um, information uh, as part of the evaluation or doing direct assessments. Um, so the evaluation is actually done by a larger group of person and larger group of people than just one person. Now the direct assessments that are done are typically done by one of three people, either a school psychometrist, a school psychologist, or uh, the speech language pathologist. Um, and in the state of Oklahoma, we have um, credentialing um, that distinguishes these um, specific roles and what these, uh, what type of evaluations these roles can do. So a school psychometrist is a master's level um, individual who has had training in administering and interpreting uh, diagnostic assessments that are related to the psychoeducational piece of an evaluation. So they can give cognitive tests, they can give academic achievement tests, um, and those type things. As, uh, the next level is a, what they call an educational specialist in school psychology, or we call them EDS, because we like acronyms. Uh, and EDS is a master's plus 60, plus they 60 hours of uh, classwork, plus they have to do a, a year of internship. And um, they can do everything that a school psychometrist can do, plus they can do the uh, social emotional um, pieces of an evaluation. Um, and then the next level would be the school psychologist, and that's for crazy people like me who go on and get their PhD. In addition to us, then, we also have speech uh, pathologists who will do the communication and language pieces of the evaluation. We may have an occupational therapist and a, a physical and or a physical therapist participate in the uh, evaluation if those areas are areas of need or areas of concern. Um, and so like the evaluation group can turn out to be a great number of people. I told you there was categories of disability, um, and these are the 13 that the state of Oklahoma use, uses, um, understanding that um, um, the federal law is the one that actually defines categories of disability, but then it's up to each state to interpret that law. So federal laws go down to the state, states interpret the, the, um, the laws and then come out with the definitions. And I share that information just so you know that these are our 13, when I say our Oklahoma's 13 different categories, um, even though they may have the same category in a different state, it may have been interpreted differently. So just because you um, have a learning disability in one state doesn't necessarily mean you have a learning disability in another state. So there's different definitions depending on how the state interpreted the federal law. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about these 13 different categories. Again, when we say we have reason to suspect, then we would say we, uh, in order to pro uh, provide you informed consent, we would say we have reason to suspect um, a speech and language disability. We would have reason to suspect other health impairment. So we tell you which of these categories that we're suspecting that the uh, child might uh, be eligible in. Okay, it's important to understand the difference between a diagnosis and this State Department category criteria because I think that gets confusing for some parents. Um, if you get a uh, disability diagnosis outside of the school, um, it's either usually provided by a medical professional or um, a psychologist, an independent psychologist, and they use um, medical criteria or they use DSM, what we call DSM-5 criteria to make their diagnoses. 
Well, DSM-5 have, has over 157 different disorders and, and categories of disability that don't translate uh, unilaterally to State Department criteria. So again, we only have the 13 different categories of disability and the, the definitions outside of school and the definitions inside of school are not always the same. Um, number one, um, the criteria is just different and um, um, excuse me, uh, the criteria is different. And then um, understanding that a lot of our um, uh, criteria requires that input from medical or health professional, but it doesn't necessarily, um, again, equate. So uh, we're looking for those three criteria. Does he have a disability that meets state criteria? Does he um, uh, need special education services? And does that disability uh, specifically have an adverse effect on their educational performance? Um, so you'll hear the words, I'm going to test him, I'm going to assess him, I'm going to evaluate him, and kind of what are the, the differences. And I put them in order here from um, uh, narrow to broad. So a test is one piece of information. And so we would say we administered a test in math or we administered a test in reading or whatever area that we were assessing, we administered a test. An assessment is broader than that. It says we're going to assess reading and that may include a bunch of different tests. It may include uh, interviewing the teacher about the reading skills. It may include um, observing the student read. So an assessment of reading is broader than um, a test. And then the evaluation is the broadest category, which says we're going to look at everything. We're going to look at the reading and the cognitive and the behavior and all this. So we take all this information. Um, so even though we say we may be testing a kid, we're really evaluating. Um, and the State Department makes a point to say that not all evaluations should look the same. We really need to um, customize or individualize the um, the um, evaluation to the individual student. And one of the examples I give is some of our cognitive assessments are very um, reliant on motor skills. And if we gave those to Stephen Hawking's, he probably wouldn't do very well on it, but that doesn't mean uh, that his cognitive um, abilities are uh, reflective of that. So we would want to choose um, a test or an evaluation process that really kind of looked at uh, truly what he can and can't do. So when we say that the evaluation needs to be customized to the individual, that's a really important piece of it. Uh, I won't go big into this. Um, these are all factors that we need to consider when we're selecting um, tests to use with our students. Um, the, there's a lot of training that uh, the administrators of these tests go through. So the psychometrists and the EDS and the school psychologists and the speech pathologists have all had a lot of training in how to choose tests that are technically sound, that are not culturally or racially biased, um, and how to um, administer those tests in a way that don't um, have any um, negative influence. Um, okay, so for each of the 13 different categories of disability, each one of those, the State Department provides us, number one, a definition, number two, um, the required components of that, um, of that category, um, the evaluation considerations are things that we need to consider when we're um, either conducting or interpreting the evaluation, and then what are the key eligibility indicators that uh, the uh, evaluation has to um, say yes or no to. So for today's purposes, we're going to go through these four things with just one of the categories. We don't have time to do all 13, so I chose autism just uh, because it was at the top of the list, but just know that this is going to be different for each of the uh, 13 different categories. So this is autism definition, and I'm not going to read that to you, but you can see how it's um, pretty specific in, in um, the definition, as opposed to if you went to DSM-5 criteria, it would be lengthier, it's not as vague and those kind of things. So this is the autism definition. Each of our categories has a definition like this one. 
these are the required components. So if you, we did a, uh, an evaluation where we suspected autism, we would have to make sure that we covered each of these areas. Um, we can do more than that. We just can't do less than that. These are the required components. After that, they give us some uh, considerations, things that we need to consider when we're planning our evaluation. And for example, again, I won't read this one to you, but we have to have medical information. Um, the medical diagnosis of autism isn't required. It's just we have to get medical information from a licensed physician. And then the other thing this one suggests that we do is that we do the uh, communication, uh, evaluate the communication area before we do any other uh, evaluation. And that makes sense because that's going to kind of guide us as to what instruments to use and not use once we know the child's um, communication level. So it gives us considerations like that. And then the fourth area it gives us is just the indicators. So for a child to be eligible under the category criteria of autism, the impairments must be documented in both communication and social and that adversely affect educational performance. And you'll see that in every one of the eligibility indicators, adversely affect educational performance, because you can have a disability and it not adversely affect educational performance. So you will see that in all the um, indicators. Uh, we all always have what they call rule outs in our indicators, which we, means in, in this case, it says lack of appropriate instruction in reading. Um, and we've rolled out limited English proficiency. So they give us rule outs that we have to make sure that we've uh, addressed those. Um, and they've added here that autism is not just for, uh, autism it can include um, other, um, this is back when they had Asperger's, but anyway, it can include Asperger's or any kind of social communication disorder. Okay, I'm going to quickly kind of review the um, components of the evaluations just so you know kind of what to expect. Vision and hearing is one of them, and, and um, this is on most of most required components. And so uh, typically we do a vision and hearing screening uh, with all children. I think we actually try to do those at the very young age with all children, whether we uh, suspect a disability or not. Uh, but it's one of those really initial rule outs that if they're not um, uh, uh, progressing in school like we thought they would, do they need, can they hear and can they see? We really have to um, address those needs before we can hardly do anything else. So we will ask for a vision and hearing screen screening just to kind of rule that out. Um, and if it becomes a problem, we really work with the parents in trying to get that resolved so that we can proceed. Um, but the law says we have to rule it out as so that we know that it's not the primary reason for a suspected disability. And then the categories of deaf blindness, deafness and hearing impaired and vision impairment and blindness, they all require vision hearing evaluation um, from a physician. Okay, we ask for health and medical information. We do this in a number of different ways. Um, it can be uh, Maybe you fill out a form or maybe you get interviewed about your child's medical history and that's enough information. Uh, we uh, sometimes ask for information from uh, their pediatrician. Uh, we can sometimes get information from the school nurse. Um, there is a form that the State Department has if we're going to get information from a licensed phys physician. It's a two-page report and it uh, asks the uh, physician specific questions to answer. Um, and just so you know, even though those categories you see at the bottom there require that we get medical information, it doesn't require a diagnosis. I think the intent of this is that we just make sure we're not overlooking anything that needs to be considered uh, in the way of medical history. Um, so we do um, ask for medical information from a licensed physician if we're considering those categories. The adaptive behavior is typically a rating scale and observations that will uh, give us an indication of um, your child's independence level as far as self-care care skills. And if we were to define adaptive behavior, it's uh, how independent they are at meeting the demands of their environment when they're compared with same age peers. So are they developmentally as independent as they should be um, for their age? And again, these can be done by rating scales. You'll see something maybe come home that's called the Vineland or the ABAS are two that are uh, frequently used. 
you'll fill out, fill out a rating scale, somebody at the school will fill out a similar rating scale, and it gives us some information about their um, adaptive behavior functioning. Social emotional um, uh, components, um, these can look very different. Um, they're not like a test so per se. They could be rating scales, they could be observations, uh, lots of interviewing, um, lots of personal inventories that we do with the students. Um, and one of the things I wanted to point out about this area is we frequently do what we call an FBA, which is a functional behavior assessment. And we understand that all behavior serves a function. And if we understood the function of that behavior, um, we can more um, appropriately and more effectively intervene with the behaviors that we're not wanting to see. So you'll often see FBA as part of the um, evaluation uh, for that social emotional area. Um, the other things we look at, um, some of the rating scales that you might see come home, the BASC, the Connors, CDI stands for Child Depression Inventory, SSIS stands for Social Skills Improvement System. Uh, there's several that relate to the social skills of children we suspect of having autism. Uh, the ADOS is a direct assessment, and then CARS and ASRS are rating scales. So we collect up a lot of information on social emotional when we have concerns about either behavior or social, um, uh, social communication, social skills, those kind of things. Um, this is what you would call an IQ test. That's what most of us call this. Cognitive assessment or IQ assesses general uh, intelligence. And so uh, you'll see um, different tests, uh, the Wechsler scales, there's the, there's one for preschool, there's one for um, up through age 16, and then there's one for adults. So um, the Wechsler scales have different versions of them. The Woodcock-Johnson is frequently used. Um, KABC is the Kaufman. Uh, so there's different types of tests that you might see. They're all looking at assessing uh, just general intelligence. And so we put um, tasks in front of the child and ask them to solve them. And then we uh, score them on their ability to do that. Um, and then we compare their performance to a group of same age uh, peers. And we can kind of uh, get a sense of um, uh, cognitively what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, you'll hear um, different kinds of scores being related to uh, cognitive assessment and we'll kind of go over scores later um, but just know that there's uh, general ability scores and sometimes you'll hear them called a full-scale IQ or a general ability index and this is when we take all the tasks that we've given them let's say we give them 10 different tasks to do and we come up with the score based upon all 10 tasks um, that would be your general ability score and then there's um, scaled scores or um, um, a scaled scores, which is looking at the individual tasks or what we call subtest and um, saying, okay, uh, we gave them a, a, a subtest in this and it's looking at the specific skills involved in that one subtest. And so that would be a subscale score. But we'll talk more about scores later. What I want you to take away from this slide is that really our ability to interpret these, um, uh, we're much better at interpreting the full scale or the general ability than we are those processing scores. And so that's um, when we interpret them, we look at that full scale IQ uh, as holding more weight. Okay, academic achievement. Um, so there's eight specific skills in looking at academic achievement and um, listening comprehension, all expression, basic reading, reading comprehension, reading fluency, math calculation, math problem solving, and written expression. So when we have a child that's struggling with academics, we would look at those eight areas and say, how are we gonna tackle this? Or how are we gonna approach assessing each of these areas? Because of, by the time they get to us, they've had a lot of um, school-based assessments already, uh, universal screenings and uh, teacher formative tests and those kind of things. So we have information. And we might say, okay, everybody, all the information we have says he's doing fine in math, and we don't have a concern there, but he's really struggling with reading based upon everything that we know. So we would do uh, further assessment just in that area of reading. 
um, to make sure that we understand exactly where his current academics are in the relation to reading and uh, where his strengths are. And some of those tests um, that you'll see on that are the WIAD is, is um, the test that relates to, the, it's a Weschler test also, but it's an achievement test. The WJ is the achievement version of the WJ we talked about cognitively, because we do a lot of comparison between that cognitive test and the academic test. And so you may see any of these um, be involved in your child's evaluation. Communication status has to do with what most of our speech pathologists do these evaluations um, and they look at either or both a language impairment or a speech impairment and there's different tests that they give to look and see if there's a delay in any either one of those areas and if so how much of a delay there is. Motor abilities, we have occupational therapists and physical therapists that would evaluate this area. Physical therapists tend to evaluate in gross motor skills. So um, things like running and jumping and, and uh, standing and walking and those kind of things where occupational therapists would evaluate the fine motor skills. We want to make sure they can hold a pencil and cut with scissors and, and do those kind of things. Um, and so they, if there's a concern in those areas, those two individuals may be involved in the evaluation. Observation is really important. Um, it's a legal requirement. It's, an, it's um, component in all 13 categories. Uh, it must be done in the classroom. Uh, so I can't like pull a kid into my office and observe him there. I've got to actually observe him in the classroom. And it's really important information that comes to kind of see all the variables that are involved in, and seeing kind of firsthand um, uh, what the student is struggling in. Um, and it helps us again, develop those interventions, um, kind of knowing what's going on in the classroom. Social cultural is information we get from the parents, just kind of that uh, history, both school history and home history and anything else that might influence uh, our evaluation that we, factors that we would need to take into consideration. Um, we could then do this through interview. Sometimes you get a uh, form sent home to you asking you to complete the form. Uh, and then sometimes we do the form and we still have questions. So we may call you and ask you questions about that. But again, trying to get a big picture of the, of the whole child and kind of what their history is and, and what kind of um, uh, uh, educational history they've had is, is important information for us. Okay, I told you I would talk to you about test scores um, and I'm not going to get real deep into this, but I do want you to kind of understand we tend to throw a lot of scores at you and uh, when we're going over evaluation results, but these are the three big ones you probably need to understand. The standard score is that one I was referring to when I was talking about the cognitive assessments. We, we present those results in standard scores so that we can, again, do those comparisons. What can your child do compared to uh, other uh, students the same age? And so you've heard an IQ score, and we'll just call it IQ for right now, but an IQ score typically has an average or a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, um, 15 uh, plus or minus points. So anything from 85 to 115, a score, uh, a standard score in that range is considered average. That's where the middle two thirds of our children fall. Um, so we're, we're good with um, that interpretation. The further below 85 and the further above 150 you get, they, you get into um, uh, rarities. And so standard scores let us compare not only um, your child score to other child scores, but if your child has an IQ of 100, then his academic achievement, we compare it to that, which also has a standard score. And is it 100 or is it 90 or is it 110? Again, looking at kind of um, those comparisons and those averages, standard scores allow us to do that. Percentile ranks, we can apply a percentile rank to any standard score, but it's kind of gives you a different picture because it'll tell you um, where your child ranks. If we took 100 children that were the same age as your child and ranked them from 1 to 100, where would they fall in that uh, ranking? Would they be number 62 out of 100? Would they be number 43? It gives you an idea of where they rank in compared to their, their peers. 
And then T-scores are another kind of scores that we use, and you'll see some of these on um, rating scales mainly, but it's the same premise as a standard score, except it has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. Um, so we look at things that are above 60 or below 40 before we um, start saying it's outside of the average range. Um, so you'll see, um, see those test scores. Um, and I will just tell you, if you come up with any other test score that you don't understand, because there's a lot of different types of test scores out there, please ask questions. Um, there, you know, you'll get a RIT score. Well, I don't know what a RIT score is. Well, ask, okay? Uh, it's really important that you understand um, uh, your child's test scores. Okay, and this is just a picture of what we call the bell curve. And I told you anything between 85 and 115, which is, comprises 68% of our kids. Uh, is in that average range, and then as you get further out on either end, um, uh, the, blue shade, the blue shades would be uh, either below average or above average. Um, so again, kind of you can plot where your student is on any test score that's given to you using this, and this is again standard scores. Okay, I want to say a few words because these are the things that can get confusing, and so if you have questions about this, I do want you to ask. Uh, we have a category called developmental delay, and it's a little different than the other 12 categories, so I wanted to make sure you understood. The intent of developmental delay was uh, the understanding that as children who are very young uh, and not easy to test and developing still, that we need to be kind of open-minded about uh, we may not be 100% accurate at what we do with these kids because they're changing, they're hard to test. Yes, we test two-year-olds, and it's really sometimes hard to get a two-year-old to do what you want them to do. Anyway, so we, uh, we realized that, and so they came up with the category of developmental delay that said, okay, between the ages of three and nine, we're going to use this, uh, this uh, kind of umbrella category, and um, we're still going to require you to put the suspected category, like we're going to call them developmental delay, but we're going to say that the other category is just suspected at this time. We're not ready to like firmly commit to it at this point. So that was the intent of development delay. It was a good idea. Um, you need to understand a couple of different things about it though. Not all uh, LEAs use developmental delay as a category. We do have the option of using it or not using it. So you may go to a district that has chosen not to use it. Um, so it's kind of this optional category. Um, the other two things you need to know is there's some categories that kind of trump developmental delay where we, we do know and we can commit and those would be uh, deaf blind, hearing impaired and deafness and vision impairment and blindness. So you would never see developmental delay where those are the uh, disabilities. And then the other thing you need to know is our state guidance uh, tells us that the category of specific learning disability uh, generally does not apply to three, four, and five-year-olds, so we wouldn't use that as a suspected when we use developmental delay. Um, the other category has, uh, that I wanted to make sure that we touched on was specific learning disability, and I just realized I have a typo in there. I'll fix that. Uh, specific learning disability, and there's two ways that the state gives us to identify um, a student with a specific learning disability. And this is the simple version of this. There's a lot of rule outs and that kind of same, uh, thing, but there's either method one is what they call the discrepancy model. It's been around the longest and says that if um, there's a discrepancy between the cognitive test score and the academic achievement test score of at least 1.5 standard deviations, which is 22 points, uh, then that's what you need to be considered having a specific learning disability. And then the other uh, method they give us is response to intervention. The theory behind response to intervention that says that if we've done all that we can do as far as uh, intervening to get the child um, to um, progress in his academic skills, we've done all the rule outs, we've done, um, you know, attendance is an issue, um, uh, language isn't an issue, um, medical factors aren't an issue. If we've done all those rule outs, and this child is still not responding to our intervention at a rate that would get him caught up eventually, then we, by default, assume that the only other explanation could be that he has a learning disability. 
So that's what response to intervention is and how you would qualify using that process. Um, dyslexia falls under specific learning disability as long as it meets the criteria. And then the other category I wanted to touch on was emotional disturbance. Uh, it's, off, it's a difficult one. It's often misunderstood. This, I've gone ahead and included the definition, but it has the most components to it too, because you have to have at least one of these five characteristics. They have to have been exhibited over a long period of time. They've had to have been to a marked degree, and they've had to adversely affect their educational performance. So we look at all of that when we're uh, suspecting emotional disturbance as a suspected disability. Um, this definition goes on to have this exclusion. It says social maladjustment can be, uh, the term does not include socially maladjusted uh, unless it's determined that they also have an emotional disturbance. So socially maladjusted is one of those things that would exclude somebody from um, uh, being eligible under emotional disturbance. And the best definition of social maladjustment that I can give you right now is those purposeful and a social destructive and delinquent behaviors that are not related to an emotional disturbance. So it really takes a good evaluation to be able to kind of weed that out and say what's a social maladjustment and what's an emotional disturbance. And um, it's something that uh, good training and good experience and good supervision will uh, hopefully ensure that gets done accurately. Okay, and then once we get the evaluation completed, uh, we do what we call a MEGS, and MEGS is an acronym for Multidisciplinary Evaluation and Eligibility Group Summary. It takes all the information we have, and then based upon that information, we make a decision about whether the student has a disability, whether it's adversely affecting their educational performance, and whether it requires special education services. So put all this information on the one document. Um, and then at the uh, last page of this document, everybody signs. Now there is a place if you disagree with the conclusions of the, the summary, then you would check that you disagree and then you would submit uh, a document that explains why, what you're disagreeing with and why, you would dis why you're disagreeing with it. Um, so there is that um, provision for you. Okay. Uh, how does the evaluation drive services? You should see a direct alignment between everything, between this, uh, the interventions and the suspicions when that reason to suspect got triggered, what the evaluation ended up looking like, the evaluation results, and then if they're eligible, that, uh, that should drive what we do next. So, and it should drive what we do next, regardless of whether they're eligible or not, because uh, they were referred for a reason, we still have to address the issues. Uh, so some of the things you need to know about that is category does not drive services. So just because you're this category or that category, there's not a set, um, set, set of services for a specific category because all children are unique and the idea between an I, behind an IEP is that it is individualized. So category does not drive services. A good evaluation, again, is going to identify all the unique disability related needs, but also their strengths, because we wanna be able to capitalize on their strengths in order to help with uh, their needs. Um, this information is presented on the IEP. It's a part of the I IEP and uh, you'll see it under the, uh, a page that says objective statements. Um, and then based upon that, then the, then aligns with any kind of goals or accommodations uh, that we develop. So you should see a straight line from beginning to end, and it ends hopefully in an IEP that addresses all the concerns that were brought to the table before that IEP was written. Uh, and we're going to talk briefly about an IEE. IEE stands for Independent Educational Evaluation. And what that is, is if the school has done an evaluation and you disagree with it, um, this is the recourse of actions you can take. You can request what they call an IEE. An IEE is done by an independent evaluator, uh, somebody who doesn't work for the LEA, kind of this third party and unbiased person. Um, the parent has the right to obtain that IEE at public expense. If they disagree with the evaluation that we've done, you have to let us do an evaluation first but if we've done the evaluation and you disagree with it, then you can request the IEE. 
You can always do your own IE if you're willing to pay for it. You can bring one into the school before we do an evaluation, after we do evaluation, whenever you want to do it. If you're willing to pay for it, then you can do that IE whenever you want. Um, once you request an IE from the LEA, uh, they will typically give you a list of vetted or approved um, uh, uh, evaluators. Um, you know, these are, are ones that uh, we've them, you know, we've checked their credentials and we've got vendor agreements with them and those kind of things. So it, um, usually, most of the time, parents pick that. You don't have to if you want to pick somebody outside of the um, uh, list that you're provided. Uh, there is certain parameters um, regarding uh, who you can pick and it has to do with their credentials. Um, rate of pay, those kind of things. So there is a way to request somebody outside of that and um, there are parameters on, on just not anybody can do an evaluation. So um, the State Department provides guidance about that. Um, so if you were to uh, disagree with one of our evaluations, then uh, again, we would provide you that list or the criteria for you seeking your own evaluator. Uh, we would also offer mediation through the uh, Special Education Resolution Center, and then we have the option of uh, the due process, which we hope we never get there. Um, so that, I believe, concludes my uh, presentation, and I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa. Dr. Davis, thank you so very much. Um, for the wealth of information that you provided. Um, if you, yes, it looks like once you can con turn control over to me, then I can get my video started back. Okay. We also want to turn your video on and we'll move into the question and answer session. Um, so we have had some questions asked um, previously. Let's see. All right. There you are, Dr. Davis. Okay. Can uh, do you have the screen now? doesn't let's see I cannot start my video because the host had stopped it that's okay we'll just move forward right now and while you're answering questions I might be able to figure it out okay all right so please continue to submit your questions through the question and answer section and I'll go ahead dr. Davis we have about five minutes for five to seven minutes for questions and answers okay. And we'll let you know when um, when it's the last question. Okay. Okay. So the first question we have, Mitchie Morris asks, how do you recommend vision and hearing screens for schools on distance learning? Oh, that is a good question. Um, we are um, arranging. You know, we're we're very cognizant of keeping everybody safe, and so I can only tell you what we're doing in our district. Uh, it may be different from district to district, district, but we do have the parents uh, bring them in at a scheduled time uh, in a scheduled way so that they're um, not in the hallways when other kids are in the hallways and those and those kind of things. Um, but we do have them come in for pieces of the evaluation. We are not doing um, virtual assessments when we need kind of doing those direct assessments. Um, so we arrange a time for the uh, parent to bring them in. Great, thank you. Next question. I don't think my child is getting what he needs at his school. Can I transfer to another school or to another school district? Another good question. You can always request a transfer and then the receiving um, school district uh, considers it and decides whether they can um, accept it or not. And that's based upon um, several factors. Uh, a lot of it has to do with do we have the room and space to take on an, an additional student. So, um, but all school districts or all parents can make a request. Thank you. Next question. One of the teachers who participated in filling out behavior rating forms did not get along with my child. I feel that his impressions were slanted negatively. Can I request a different teacher? I would hope that maybe you would have those conversations up front, maybe during a consent meeting. You know, I talked about that informed consent. And if you had those concerns, bring them up now. 
uh, bring them up then. Um, I don't know that I would say we wouldn't have that teacher for ladder rating scale, but maybe we have a second teacher for ladder rating scale because it really is important to get different perspectives. And um, so, you know, we can have other um, other teachers or other people who work with that student uh, fill out rating scales so that we get more of a balanced approach. Um, but it's just one, you know, I, again, those, those evaluations are a lot of information and that is just one piece of it and would never um, define, uh, make any decision. It's just one piece of, um, uh, one piece of the puzzle. Thank you. Another question we have here. Some of the tests I have from an outside provider has some personal family information that I don't want to share with the school. Can I give the school part of the testing and leave out the parts I don't want them to see? As the parent, you absolutely have complete control over the information um, that is presented to the school. Um, again, I think I would hope that these conversations would happen um, at the beginning uh, when you're talking with the uh, independent evaluator and to say, I want you to know this, but I would like the school not to know this. And then that an independent evaluator can use his professional judgment as to whether it's, um, uh, I don't know, a, an important thing for the school to know or not and have that conversation with you. And it may be that they say, you know, I know this, but I don't need to share it with the school, so I'm not gonna include it in the report. Um, and it may be that they say, you know what, this is a really important thing, the school does need to know it. So again, have that conversation up front before um, uh, it even gets to the school. If if it's after the fact and you it's already, the report is already written and it's really something you don't want the school to have, um, you can, I would prefer that you redact the information that you um, uh, don't want the school to have as opposed to taking off pages. Um, when you take off the pages and we have part of a, re part of a report, um, you're kind of left wondering what else do we need to know that we are missing because sometimes it's usually just a sentence or two here or there. Um, so redact the things that you don't want, but it, you know, Again, have that conversation up front and just ask the uh, independent evaluator not to include it. Great, and one final question, Dr. Davis. Mm -hmm. My child has a diagnosis of autism. The school says his behaviors are a choice on his part and not due to autism. I don't agree. How can they decide that? That's a good question. And um, that's where a really good evaluation will be helpful in trying to weed those out. Um, but even past the um, discussion about eligibility, though, I, I hear conversations like this, and I kind of think um, they're not productive. Uh, it's more productive to talk about what function is that behavior serving for that student, whether it be a choice or not, it's still serving a function, and we still have to deal with it, and we still have to intervene on it. So does it really matter that it's related to a, a category of disability or not? So um, I would, I would, yes, let's get a good evaluation done. But in doing that, let's focus on what we can do about the behaviors as opposed to um, trying to excuse it or not excuse it or those kind of things that really aren't productive to help us. Great. Well, thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. Um, if you did, if you did not get your question answered, you can follow up with Sherilyn Walton on our team or reach out to Michelle DeBerry with the State Department of Education, who's also one of the ARC of Oklahoma's new board members. We hope today's webinar was helpful. And please join us the upcoming Tuesdays for our webinar series. Next week, behaviors will be the topic assistive technology the week of October 20th, and transition services October 27th. Uh, what's next after graduation and how the school system can help prepare your child for that next phase in life. You will receive an email tomorrow with a survey about today's webinar. Please take time to respond to that and to let us know what other topics you would like us to cover in the future. Now be sure to follow us on social media for details about the upcoming webinars and also other events.
Finally, please stay connected with us and reach out with questions that you didn't get answered today or questions you think of later. Again, we're here to help. Thank you all for joining us and have a great day.